You're one of the most voracious readers I know. You've called yourself a conscious bookworm, and you've read a ton. How did you first get interested in reading? Uh, reading was my first love. You know, I, I know that in my childhood, when I was around 9, 10, 11 years old, I was a latchkey kid. Uh, my mom was working uh, multiple jobs, and then she was going to school at night. And we were raised by a single mother, my brother and I were, in New York City. And uh, we were in a part of New York City that isn't very safe. So uh, I basically, the, the library was my uh, was my after-school center. So after I'd come back from school, I'd just go straight to the library, and I'd just hang out there until they closed. Uh, and then I'd come home. So that was just my daily routine. But I think even by that point in time, I, I'd already loved books. I was reading books as a child. Uh, I remember my grandparents' house in India, I'd be a little kid on the floor going through all of my uh, grandfather's Reader's Digests, which is just all he had to read there. Uh, I mean, now, of course, there's a smorgasbord of information out there. Everybody can read anything all the time. But back then, it was much more limited. So I would read comic books. I would read Reader's Digests. I would read storybooks, uh, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. Mysteries. I was big into mysteries. Um, so I think I, I just always love to read because uh, I'm, I'm actually an antisocial introvert. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was just lost in the world of words and ideas from an early age. Uh, I think some of it comes from the uh, happy circumstance that when I was young, nobody forced me on what to read. I think there's a tendency among parents and teachers to say, oh, you should read this, but don't read that. The reality is I just read a lot that by today's standards would be considered mental junk food. Uh, but eventually you just get to like reading, you run out of the junk food and then you start eating the healthy food, <laughs> right? Or your tastes kind of graduate. Um, so I think to some extent that's what happened with me because I started from comic books and then went from that into mysteries and went from that into fantasy, then into sci-fi, and then from sci-fi made into science and then mathematics and then philosophy. Um, so it, it just kind of kept climbing up the stack. But I'm lucky that there was no one around when I was seven years old or six years old saying, oh, you shouldn't read that. You should read this instead. Is most of what you read today physical or on a computer or Kindle? Uh, for convenience, it's mostly Kindle. Uh, it's not the Kindle device itself. It's an iPad. Uh, and uh, But for books that I really, really like, I will also buy a physical copy. So I have both. Uh, so there's no excuse not to read it. Uh, you know, a, a really good book costs 10 or $20 and it can change your life uh, in a meaningful way. So it's not something I believe in saving money on. And this is even back when I was broke and I had no money. I, I always spent money on books. I never viewed that as an expense. Uh, that's an investment to me. And I probably spend uh, 10 times as much money on books as I actually get through. So in other words, like for every $200 worth of books I buy, I actually end up making it through 10%. So I'll read $20 worth of books, but it's still absolutely worth it. You and I have uh, that in common. Yeah. And anything that's one of the greats, like if I read a book and I know that it's amazing, I'll buy multiple copies, partially to give away, partially because I have them lying around the house. Uh, and these days I find myself rereading as much or more as I do reading. Uh, because I, I think this was a tweet from an account on uh, on Twitter that I saw, this guy, Illustratus, and he basically said, you know, I don't want to read everything. I just want to read the 100 great books over and over again. And I think there's a lot to that. So it's really more about identifying what are the great books to you, because different books speak to different people, uh, and then really absorbing those. Because I don't know about you, but I, don't, I, I have very poor retention. Uh, I have to, you know, I skim, I speed read, I jump around. Uh, and I could not tell you specific passages or quotes uh, from books, but I, but at some deep level, you do absorb them and they become part of the threads of the tapestry of your psyche. Um, so they do kind of weave in there. Uh, there are there are books that I'm sure you've had this feeling where you pick up a book, you start reading it, you're like, oh, this is pretty interesting, this is pretty good, and you're getting this increasing sense of deja vu, and then about two thirds or halfway through the book, you realize, oh, I've read this book before. <laughs> Um, and that's yeah. perfectly fine. It means you were ready to reread it. You've said before you think of books as throwaways. How did you come to think about books like that? And what impact has that had on what you read? I mean, that's really an impact of the internet. Um, once the internet came along, I think it's destroyed everybody's attention span. Because now all of humanity's works are available to you at any given time. And you're being interrupted constantly. So just our, our attention span goes down. Our ability to focus goes down. But at the same time, we just become more judicious we also want uh we want the meat and the the problem with books is that to write a book to publish it to publish a physical dead tree uh book it just takes a lot of work and effort and money so sometimes people 
start putting long, uh, wrapping long books around simple ideas. Those are probably my least favorite books. And it's kind of why I avoid the whole business and self-help category because you, you generally have one good idea and it's buried in uh, hundreds or thousands of pages and lots of anecdotes. Um, so what happened was I, I just noticed that sometime in the late 90s, I stopped reading as much as I used to, and I started reading more blogs. I started reading less books and more blogs, and great blogs like Farnham Street, and, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Simler's blog, Melting Asphalt, and so on. You, you get incredibly smart people digestifying, simplifying, uh, and, and writing these great things, but it's only a page or two or three pages. So I got really into blogs. Uh, but then I'd stop reading books and a lot of the oldest wisdom is actually in books. Uh, and with books, you're now talking about the combined works of all of humanity as opposed to just who happens to be blogging right now. So I realized I missed that. Uh, and then with the Kindle and the iBooks coming along, that allowed me to start treating books like I treat blogs, which is, uh, when I go to a blog, I'll actually skim through lots of articles until I find one that looks really interesting. I'll read that whole article all the way through and maybe take notes. So now I treat books the same way, which is I'll skim through a large number of books. I'll put them down. I'll jump around, back, forward, middle uh, until I find a part that's interesting. Then I'll just consume that piece. And I won't feel guilty about having to finish the entire book uh, because I just view it as a blog archive, right? It's like a, like a blog might have 300 posts on it and you can read just the two, three, five that you need right now. And I think you can think of a book the same way. And then that opens the world and web of books back open to us uh, uh, instead of it being uh, buried somewhere. Uh, I think, you know, like many people, I know of a lot of friends uh, who are currently stuck on a book somewhere. And if you ask people if they read, everybody says they read. Everybody says they're reading a book. They can answer which book they're reading. But the reality is very few people actually read and actually finish books. Yes, and I think, yeah. And I think that's probably because of all these societal and personal um, uh, rules that we've put up like you must finish a book and you must read books that are good for you and you can't read junk food books and this is a hot book right now and so on the reality is i don't actually read that much compared to what people think like the re i probably read one to two hours a day uh, which and that puts me in the top 0. 0.00001%. one <laughs> percent uh, I think that alone accounts for any material success that I've had in my life and any intelligence that I might have because real people don't read an hour a day. Real people, I think, read a minute a day or less. Uh, so it, making it an actual habit is the most important thing. And how you make it a habit doesn't matter. It's very much like exercise or working out. Do something every day. It almost doesn't matter what you do. So the people who are obsessing over, like, should I be weight training or should I be doing tennis or should I be doing Pilates or should I be doing the high intensity training method versus the happy body versus whatever, they're missing the point. The important thing is to do something every day. It doesn't matter what it is. So the same way I would argue the important thing is to read every day. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter what you read because eventually you'll read enough things and, and your interest will lead you there that, that it will dramatically improve your life. So just like the best workout for you is the one that you're excited enough to do every day, the same way I would say the best books to read are the ones that are books or blogs or Twitter or whatever, anything with ideas and information and learning. The best ones to read are the ones that you're excited about reading all the time.